Welcome back, everybody. Hello. Nice to see you. Oh, um, the music went away so fast. So fast today. That was so strange. We were both kind of vibing a little bit, weren't we? But I'm Paige. And I'm Cindy. And, and this, this is Mom's, Mom's the Word. Word. Where Mom knows best. Or at least she's trying her best. That's right. And we do have been back today, you guys. By popular request, yes, we were is. told, bring in the part two. They said, hurry up. And I said, I haven't even heard it and yet, We you guys. don't even know what's happened yet. That's right. So we also get to have another very special guest Possibly. later Possibly. I'm on. waiting to hear back. I'm waiting to hear back. It's possible that <laughs> I'll be able to bring my mother in to kind of fill us in on some of the details that occurred. So last episode. Yes. Mm-hmm. Recap I was, a little bit. I was kind of laying down the groundwork for how we ended up in Dallas, Mm -hmm. laying the groundwork for how Elijah and I ended up in Mexico. And then we had just gotten to the part where my mom and dad were on the ground in Mexico trying to find Elijah after he's been missing for a while. I do want to say, I I went to great lengths last episode to be vague about the people involved. Um, But after consulting a lot of people and some legal experts, I'm recounting fact. I'm not slandering or attacking anybody. So everybody gets a name today. Everybody gets a name because I feel it's important that we're honest and we're, we're outright. Um, and I also, as a man, it's tough for me to admit this, but I was victimized by these people. Yeah. And I realized that not naming them was not like a, cause I'm a very, I, I love, you know, strategy. I love being wise, especially about this because yeah, like, I've not forgotten. I'm not just going to let my brother disappear, you yeah. know? Um, but I think the, the, the guise of being wise was actually like, the cover for actually just being afraid to name people. And yeah. so I'm only smiling guys because I am here for naming names. Yeah. Like if you did wrong, come on now. Yeah. And let me just say <laughs> the names that are named and the people that are named, I ask that you not blow them up, that you not message them, that you not call them, that you not interrupt their church services because the reality is um, it's happened and it's terrible. Now, if you want to not attend these places or warn your friends who are attending these places, yeah. or you know, if you want to call for accountability, I think accountability should be called for. Um, but we're not going to do this whole, you know, you're not going to call people murderers. You're not going to call people, you know, evil because the reality is I'm going to give you the factual accounting of events mm-hmm. you can do with that information, you know, piece it together how you will. We had an investigative reporter spend years putting together an article for us. He asked people for comment. Um, Multiple people chose not to comment. So um, I'm going to recount the characters thus far that I have discussed. So the church that we attended was the Upper Room Dallas. Mm -hmm. Um, It is a kind of a, a Bethel type it's, it's in, like I said, it's, it's the new apostolic reformation in AR. So it's kind of adjacent to Bethel, which Bethel has come under fire for its own sort of controversies. Uh, and the upper room is not without its controversies as well. Um, I want to state that just because they invited these people to speak at a service does not mean that they're complicit with these people. I think just like I was swooped away by the idea of a ministry doing great things in Mexico, mm-hmm. we can't fault the upper room for mm-hmm. so too wanting to support them. Mm-hmm. Um, the shortcomings of the upper room will come later in the story, specifically at the hands of the head pastor, Michael Freeland Miller, um, who many people also have issues with him. Uh, the organization that we stayed with in Mexico was called Way Cool Angels. It is a subsidiary nonprofit wing of Way Cool People, which I'm not sure if that's still in operation. Um, Way Cool People was chaired by several people, but the two people in Mexico, the husband and wife, were Raul Garcia and Karen Faith Garcia, now Karen Faith Heller, because I believe they had a divorce. Um, And then the two girls, Grace and Michelle, um, which they were and are probably still as victimized as I was. Mm -hmm. Um, That's just my speculation, though. Don't don't sue me for that. and uh, let me see. So those were the ones who lived at the house out there mm-hmm. in Agnes. Mm-hmm. So those are the two girls that you were talking about. Yes, okay. who, who were with Karen and Raul. Okay. Um, Grace kind of, from my recollection, my mom has better input because she actually connected with Grace's mom. Uh, Grace was taken in by these people and wooed the same way and just completely cut off contact with her family. Um, because what they do is they, they really polarize you against your family. Now, Michelle brought most of her family in. I reached out to her cousin for comment. Her cousin is the one who, I don't know if I mentioned this in the last episode about reaching out to me on Reddit. Yeah, so yes. Her cousin, um, re- I reached out to her for comment to see if she could provide some insight. And um, she didn't get back to me. So I do know that if I go back through our messages, there's, you know, in depth about the way that Michelle and I think her 
dad or her grandpa or maybe her uncle and then her sister moved down to Cabo and then they just kind of cut off contact with their family and mm-hmm. they were told that you know you shouldn't talk to your family like they want to pull you away from what God is doing here so mm-hmm. uh, I think that's everybody um, that needs to be named right now um, like I said everybody will have kind of a role to play so hey mom hello hey did you call I did call I wanted to see if you had like 10 or 15 minutes and if you were willing to, to share about, because right now I'm trying to recount what happened to you guys in Mexico and I'm fucking it up pretty good. Okay. So, okay. So uh, we've been slow. I mean, we've been steady, but slow. Let me ask your dad. Okay. Ben, can I take 15 minutes to go talk with Benjamin and his mom's group about what happened in Mexico? <laughs> <laughs> We're leaving that in. Please leave that in. We're his mom's group. Yeah. I love that so much. He says yes. Okay, so right now you <laughs> the are, mom group is here. You are Bluetoothed into our soundboard, so we can all hear you. I've got Paige and Cindy with me. Hi, Hello Teresa. There. Hi, guys. Paige and Cindy. Yes. Hi. Hello. And this is Mom's nice Word. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice mom, to meet, mom nice knows meet best. you. Thank you for answering and willing to talk. We yeah. appreciate it. So, um, for we're, sure. Where I'm at right now, and again, mom, you don't you don't have to share anything. Mm-hmm. I will let you know prior to calling you. I just went ahead and like named names. You know, instead of being vague about everything, I said you know, church is the upper room, Karen and Raul, and uh, way cool angels, way cool people, Grace and Michelle, that kind of stuff. So, uh, don't be afraid to drop names. There's obviously a couple names I won't drop, as we've discussed. You know, the people who assisted us, who need to remain anonymous, won't be mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, so, where I'm at in the story right now is you and Dad are in the gas station, and you're aware that something is horribly wrong with this situation. Yeah. Well, this guy had been driving us around for a couple of days and the policeman had been driving our rental car and he had taken us that evening out to, uh, and when we got there, your dad realized that the cop knew the man that we were going to meet and he had acted like he didn't know him. So your father got back in the car and he was freaking out. I'd never seen him do that before. And uh, he just basically started telling me, okay, do what I tell you to do, my lead, this is very bad. They know each other. So I started texting all of our contact group back in the States saying, pray now, this is a 911, because we don't know what's up. And it is full on dark. And we're not supposed to be out there full on dark anyway. So I was surprised he took us because we had already been told, don't go out to the riverbed to the settlement out there in the dark. But we did. So he started taking us back to the hotel, but he went away that we had never gone before. So we were someplace we didn't recognize. And then he started to turn down an alleyway. When he started to turn down the alleyway, your dad said to him, hey, stop at this convenience store right now. I want to get some snacks before we go back to the hotel. And that's how we ended up in the convenience store. And I was being instructed to buy two of the biggest Coke bottles, glass that they had, and pick out some other snacks. So when I asked him, what is it we're doing with the Coke bottles? He said, we might need to use them. And I said, use them to hurt somebody? And he's like, yes, we need to be ready for that, because I don't know what's going on. And so he made a big deal with the ladies in the store and flirted with them and bought a bunch of snacks and acted like everything was fine. And then we went back out into the car and I'm just, you know, trying to figure out how am I going to use a Coke bottle to kill somebody if I need to? Because your father was convinced that our lives were in danger. And at that point, after all the weird things that had happened, I was convinced too that there was a lot going on that was not what it seemed to be. There were too many people interested in Elijah and his disappearance and in us Mm -hmm. that had no reason to be interested. So that's the backstory on the convenience store. We went directly back to the hotel. The guy changed his mind, didn't go back down the alley after that, took us to the hotel. And the next thing we were doing was throwing all of our stuff. Well, most of our stuff. Your dad said, be sure you leave enough stuff here to make it look like we're coming back. But take the important stuff. Because we've got to go find someplace else to go. Yeah. So where did you end up going after you guys left? Uh, you know, the, the elder at the church, um, 
was it BJ and wasn't it Pat and BL? Pat and BL. It was Pat and BL. Yeah. Uh, One of Pat's daughters lived in Cabo. She and her husband, her family lived in Cabo. And so I called Pat. She connected me to her daughter and they said, here, come, come to us. So we drove out to where they were, which was between the airport and Cabo San Lucas, about halfway. It's probably 20 kilometers from the airport to Cabo San Lucas. They lived in a residential area halfway that was where all of the famous people and the newscasters and the actors and all that lived. It was a gated community with security. It was beautiful. And so we met them out there, and they had their kids with them. They had teenage kids. So I made it very clear to them what what we thought was going on before they took us into their home. I didn't want them to be in danger without realizing that it was a possibility. And that's where we ended up at. Wow. So you guys end up there, you do a little more investigating. And then I, I know that you said at some point there was almost another, another event at that house where you guys were in danger. Yeah. They went off and left us in their house. They had in the courtyard, they had a bedroom that was built off, not part of the house, not co-joined in any way. You had to come out of the courtyard and you could go into the uh, main house. They left us there. And so we were doing our laundry in the main house and your father came running into the open kitchen living room area, slamming drawers and cabinets open in the kitchen, just frantic. And uh, so when I said, what is, what are you doing? He said, I'm looking for a knife. I'm looking for a weapon. I'm like, why are you looking for a weapon? And he said, because there are guys here and pointed towards the front door. So I walked to the front door, a pickup had pulled up. In this gated community that you could not get into without permission, there was a pickup sitting at the edge of the uh, sidewalk. And there were at least three men in the cab. I would say they were mid-20s. And there were several men in the back of the truck, you know, just riding open air. There was no yard equipment in the truck. There were no tools in the truck. So I knew immediately that they weren't there to, you know, to work. Mm -hmm. And they were standing around. One of them was on the phone like they were having a conversation, you know, like, what do we do now? Mm-hmm. And so your dad's running to the back of the house, which is all glass, and looks out over a little lake. And I'm standing in the middle of the house watching him. And he's like, you need to find a weapon. And so I caught him halfway to the front door again. And I said, you need to stop because he was freaking out. And You need to understand, I had never seen your dad freak out. Mm -hmm. When he got in the car a couple nights before and was freaking out, I I had never seen that. I had certainly never seen him searching for weapons. So I said to him, the truth is we only have one set of resources. You have a kitchen knife that is not even sharp. Look at us. We have one set of resources and we need to act like we believe that they are here for us. And he looked at me for a minute and he said, God's the only one that is going to get us out of this. He's like, you're right. You're right. So he laid the knife down on the countertop and we just started praying. We just started praying in the spirit. We started, you know, looking at each other. I don't know how long we prayed. It didn't seem like very long. Finally, he walked to the door And they got in the truck and drove away, all of them. Wow. Now, can I prove they were there to hurt us? Absolutely not. Can I explain why they were there otherwise? Absolutely not. So. Wow. So. There you go. After all that, how did you guys, you know, time and combo conclude? Did you make any progress on discovering where Elijah was? Did you find any more kind of evidence that, things were, were way worse than we thought they were? Well, the weird thing was from the very beginning, Raul said Elijah had gone off with a girl doing drugs and doing the girl in Mexico. And when he got tired of that or he got his fill, he'd be back. But what that said to me was he did not know anything about Elijah because would he go off with a girl? I, you know, possibly. But would he go off and do drugs? Absolutely not. He hated drugs. 
any of his friends that did anything, even pot gummies. He mocked them mercilessly and, and told them how stupid they were. So I knew that wasn't true. So the thing that happened then was that story got picked up by the police that were investigating, the tourist police that were investigating. Um, anybody that was repeating anything back to us, even people in Dallas. Okay, so how do people in Dallas that had nothing to do with this come to the conclusion that our son, who was missing for two days before anybody said, well, actually, Raul only admitted he was gone because I contacted him and pressed him on it. And when I said, when's the last time you saw him, he wasn't really sure. So how did that information get back to a group of people in Dallas that had nothing to do with this? Mm-hmm. Sketchy. You know, Sketchy. Yeah. there were a lot of connections that shouldn't have been there. Yeah. I was getting phone calls from people that shouldn't have had any vested interest in this at all. And so, uh, including government officials, I got a call from uh, Homeland Security. I picked up the phone call back when I used to pick up every phone call. <laughs> and this man said, uh, it's really not important that I tell you my name. What you need to know is that I work with Homeland Security. And you need to know that what is going on with your son here is not good. And you need to start getting loud and pushy immediately. Wow. So what do you say to that? I responded by going and making myself known to the FBI in Dallas. And uh, nobody would follow a missing persons report. I ended up in Nacogdoches, three hours away, our little hometown, because the sheriffs there were the only ones that were willing to even follow a missing persons report. Oh, wow. So how, once I'm we realized so, that there were a lot of people... Yeah. Go ahead. No, I'm just so curious how like the person who called you, how who was spreading all that information? Like, how did Homeland Security find out? You know, like... Uh, you know, that, I had the question too. But yeah. I, I didn't get any answers. He was there to give me information. So he was very just direct to you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That would have Absolutely. scared me. He didn't waste any time. It was a very short call. And wow. he just, you know, so it could have been anybody right. saying, hey, I'm from Homeland Security. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't figure out why anybody else would go that way. You know, yeah. everybody else, even the family who took us into their home. The day after we got there, the wife went to her Bible study. Okay, so this is Cabo San Lucas. It's a very wealthy little town. It brings in a lot of money. Mm-hmm. But it is completely controlled by the cartel because... They can launder their cash there in all the tourist industries. So my understanding was that every business that did business in that town did it under the blessing of the cartel, and they were all turning money over for the cartel. So she goes to her Bible study. She comes back, and she basically says, when she told the women who we were and what was happening, they were all horrified, and this is what they said. Tell her and her husband that they are in danger that Raul Garcia is very dangerous and that they need to go back to America and just forget about all this. Wow. Whoa. But how? How do you just forget about all of this whenever your son is there? Mm-hmm. Well, I suppose if you're a person who submits to fear regularly, mm-hmm. then you might do that, mm-hmm. you know, because... When I re- we realized pretty quickly after we got to Mexico that um, there was a lot of things happening that didn't make any sense, that our kids didn't just disappear. And I realized, especially with the leader of that Messianic synagogue, he, he liked to poke the dog, okay? Mm-hmm. He was not looking for peace. He was not trying to help us. Um, He got in, he was in public in a place my husband went, not realizing he was there. And and he did what he could to stir my husband up. So after we had been in the home of the people that lived there, they they owned a, like a top floor condo in one of the resort communities that they rented out like an Airbnb. And her parents, the elder couple from the church in Dallas, they were coming to visit. 
So they moved us to the condo because it had, it was big. It had a bunch of bedrooms so that we could stay there with their parents. At the same time, we had just realized there was a lot going on that didn't make sense. And so one of our sons didn't have a passport. Sam was waiting for his passport. So he and Benjamin were still in Texas. And so I called and I said, look, I don't think you guys need to come uh, because there's a lot going on here and I don't really understand it, except that I know that it's dangerous and people are following us, different people, not just one person, at least two different people. And then there's the cop on top of that. And people are involved in this that have no reason to be involving themselves. So I'm going to ask Uncle Dale to come. You've already heard about Uncle Dale. Mm -hmm. Uncle Dale flies to Cabo San Lucas. He's on the same plane as BL and Pat, the elders from the church. And Mm -hmm. they met each other. And so then they came to the house together. And my brother is very likable. People always usually enjoy his company. And BL and Pat were no different. So... The next day, my brother and my husband went down into what was like an open market. And my husband is from Mexico. He was raised in central Mexico. So the open market concept, little community things that happen in small Mexican communities, he's all about that. So he wanted to go to the market. They went to the market. That's where Raul was. And Martin, he wasn't calm when he found Raul and his family in the market. He went immediately to him and started confronting him verbally. Where is my son? What has happened to my son? Tell me what you know, those kinds of things. And my brother, who's got some training, he was in the Marines, and and he has stayed connected to understanding people since that time. He said he'd, he'd never seen anybody work someone else the way Raul worked my husband trying to get him really whipped up into a frenzy until my brother was basically just pulling my husband back to the car, shoving him into the car and saying, we're going back to the condo. So he came back to the house with a, an opinion of Raul based on how he saw him behave in public towards a man who was losing his mind and grieving over his eldest son. Uh, when he should have been as a member he identified himself as a Messianic Jewish rabbi. He identified himself as a member, a leader in the Christian community who ran a ministry in Cabo San Lucas. The way he responded to us didn't indicate any of that was true. He didn't offer to help us. He didn't put his arms around us. He didn't offer us any comfort. He didn't offer us any connections, any direction, nothing. He said, you should take your stuff and go back home. I'm sure Elijah will show up in a couple of weeks, tired of whatever girl he went off with. And that's the first time we heard that. Wow. So. So uh, what brought you guys from that point to, you know, finally coming home? How many days passed before you guys decided it was really time to, to head back to the States? We were in Cabo for about 10 days and we got connected to a group of people who ministered, actually took food and things down into the the riverbed area there. And they were taking uh, your dad and Uncle Dale down there with them. And they were, you know, talking to people. And they had come to the conclusion that it might be possible to find him, that that they weren't sure how to do it. And they weren't sure if they could use help. So they decided at that point that your dad was probably not going to be helpful in that situation because we were both pretty upset by then. I mean, a lot of things were happening Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at multiple levels that hurt us. And, uh, and so we decided that we would come back to Texas and that we would let continue to communicate with them and let them see what they could find out. So we came back to Texas then and, uh, then realized that there were all kinds of rumors going on in our church about our son. And all of the rumors turned that situation into something that it was not. They weren't behaving like somebody had been kidnapped and was lost. They were behaving like he had gone off doing drugs and girls. 
So now we started a second chapter of the same story that was going on in Mexico. But it shocked us because, you know, we expected to come home and have our church put their arms around us. And that is not what happened. Yeah, and I'm wondering who who was the one to kind of like beat y'all to it, like explaining what happened. Somebody was calling the church ahead of you to 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 spread rumors about Elijah. Oh, I'm sure we know who. Yeah, Mom. Yeah. Okay. We pre- we have a name for that. Okay. Because I'm just like, what you yeah, hadn't even made it home yet, and you were hearing rumors that you hadn't even known about. Like what? Who is? Yeah. Probably the the same. Well, gentleman the rabbi who had, uh, is not a rabbi. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we found out after we got back and started meeting uh, like the parents of one of the other girls who was there that the rabbi is not a rabbi that uh, the biggest Messianic Jewish church in Dallas had already warned their members in writing not to have anything to do with him or his ministry that one of the biggest Baptist churches in Dallas had already had a run in with him when he basically got the college-age daughter of one of their members to come down to his ministry and volunteer. And then she stayed and she cut off her access with her family. And so she's one of the daughters, air quotes, that they're raising or were raising then. Um, So at least two of the biggest, most powerful churches in Dallas knew this guy was trouble. There was nothing about that online. Anywhere. Yeah. I know that because people who had copies of the letters people who were involved, you know, the family of the girl who is, I suppose, still part of their family down in Cabo San Lucas, um, contacted me. And they're still there. They're still in Cabo. Mm -hmm. Hmm. As far as I know, my understanding is that Roel and his wife have divorced. Um, But the last thing I heard about the girls is that they are still part of the ministry. I I can't verify that Mm because... Honestly, I haven't done any research. Well, I, I will tell you, I have done research and <laughs> I, I don't know what's become of the ministry in Mexico. I do know that Karen, Michelle and Grace are heavily involved in this. It's like a, it's like a Christian shark tank almost. And they have seminars in Dallas, Chicago and places like that. So, um, they post about it on LinkedIn. So I was able to see kind of what they've been doing for the past couple of years on LinkedIn. So it looks like in the schism, the girls went with Karen, and I have no idea what's become of Raul. Interesting. Mm-hmm. I wonder yeah. if they'd want to talk. Oh, last last I heard, there was no comment from them. Maybe he did them dirty. Maybe. Yeah. A divorce. That's true. Typically messy. That's true. Um. So, Mom, thank you for for sharing all that history. And yes, um, thank you. I, I guess. Um, there's a lot more because I, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you guys. I lived out the nightmare, but I, uh, I threw in the towel a lot earlier than my parents did. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I'm neither proud nor ashamed of that fact. Mom and dad, um, they kept the faith for much longer than I did. Um, so my mom has way more insight and, uh, way more knowledge about everything going on, um, than I do. So, um, obviously there's discrepancies in our stories. My mom's version is true. I was, like 20 and going through this. So, you know, where I believe that we were told not to go before they left it, clearly they called us. So for anybody who wants to poke holes, my discrepancies are because (laughs) I was going through the worst nightmare of my life. And that's why my, my mom is here to, to share the the proper events that I may misconstrue. So, um, just, you know, I don't want to keep you for too long. Um, is there any other portion of this you would like to share about or, you know, because uh, I, I know for a fact there are other people who are who have lived through this. You know, we always said the reason that nobody gave a shit about Elijah is because he was a, a half Mexican man who went missing in Cabo San Lucas, uh, <coughs> and nobody cares. You know, so well, nobody believed he was there to do something other than you know indulge himself and have a good time on vacation. But the truth is, is that. Um, we never have control of the bad things that happen to us. Otherwise, bad things would never happen to us. And so we have to decide how are we going to deal with them. And I was being advised to uh, to deal with this in the same way that uh, there was a 
a beautiful blonde girl named Natalie that disappeared in one of the Caribbean countries. And that happened maybe a year, year and a half, two years before Elijah disappeared. Her mother started a foundation. She got on TV. She got the ear of the media. And she stayed on top of them until they discovered what had happened to her daughter, who by then was dead. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I was being advised to do that, to basically give my life to the pursuit of Elijah in a big and all-consuming way. Mm -hmm. But when my husband and I prayed about what to do, what we kept hearing from the Father was, unless the Lord builds a house, all of the labor, all of the laborers, they work in vain. Mm -hmm. And we believed that Elijah was alive and probably on a, a slave farm someplace. And so we didn't want to do anything that might endanger him. Mm. And we also didn't want to do anything that was contrary to what we felt like God was speaking to us. And there were a lot of people that disagreed with that. A lot of very connected, powerful Uh, experienced people that thought we ought to go a different direction. But we had to do what we felt was right, not out of fear, but out of respect. Mm -hmm. The truth is, is that if, you know, we were telling Benjamin and Elijah, hey, you do not need to go to Mexico. This is a very bad idea. When my fully Mexican aunt, she's like a Mexican princess, 16 generations back, she lives on the border in a very violent portion of the border. She's very experienced. When she was saying, you don't need to do this. Really, you shouldn't do this. I had to go negotiate my, she she was a broker for an international bridge so that she basically owned the bridge. She had to go negotiate a contract with the Mexican government for the next, I don't know, four years, 10 years, whatever, for her license and her ownership of that bridge crossing, that border crossing. A huge group of Marines showed up with armored Humvees and put her in an armored Humvee and then took her to her negotiation in Mexico, like 16 miles inside Mexico. And she said there were so many of them and they were so big. She's not a very tall woman at all. She couldn't even see where they were going. She just had to watch the steps in front of her as they escorted her in. She said, if they will do that to me on the border, in a part of the country where I am well known, you don't need to be going to Cabo at all. So when Elijah looked me in the face and said, Mom, God has told me to go, that stops all the conversation. Then we began behaving a different way. And so what I'm, what I'm going to say next is based on that. I know that if God had said to Elijah, hey, I, I want you to go here, but it's not going to turn out great. I mean, it's going to cost you something. It maybe even cost you life, cost you your life. I know Elijah would have said, okay, I'm game for that. Because like Benjamin has said before, a, Elijah wanted to help people. Elijah wanted to save people. He was always looking for somebody to rescue. But also because he had a very black and white perspective on good and evil, on God, on what life is supposed to be. So he went missing, but he chose to go down there understanding that there was significant real danger there. The people telling him that were not making stuff up. And so once somebody has made that kind of free will choice, we have to just find a way to do our best with it. Mm -hmm. Do I want to know where my son is? Yes. Would it have been easier if they had found a body and he had been dead? Yes, because we would have known where he was. I'm not a grieving mother who needs to pretend her kid is alive. It's worse that he's alive because every week we still pray for him with a group of people. And it's been almost 10 years. But the only way we knew how to get through this was to get through it trusting that God was in charge, even though nobody here was in charge, and nobody here in the United States or Mexico was taking any responsibility or authority for this. So we figured out how to move forward 
broken, very distressed, but to move forward in a way that we felt like honored God. Wow. How hard that must be. Yeah. To keep the faith. I know that it would have been easy in any in other any way. way. Yeah. You know, it's, I, I know it was hard, but I don't know that it was harder than anything, you know, other parents have done. Yeah. And did you have to leave that church that, that you were was, a part of? Oh, um, yeah. We arrived like you had to change Texas your whole life? Yeah, we, were, we intended to leave that church completely. Mm-hmm. And God said, no, you can't leave. So we spent the next two years. That church has 6 a.m. prayer sets. They start at 6 a.m. in the morning with music and prayer. And it goes all day. Sometimes, some days it goes till midnight. So their, their goal was to have 24-7 prayer and worship going on all the time. So we spent the next two years there going to 6 a.m. prayer sets and praying for the people in the church, for the body, praying for the leadership. Because leadership behaved very badly in this situation. And uh, there's some pretty serious judgments for people that behave that way, listed in black and white in the New Testament. Uh, The one that comes to mind, the one that the Lord just pressed us with was, I was sick and you didn't take care of me. I was in prison and you didn't come minister to me. I was broken and you didn't hug me. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. And that's how they behave towards us. And if you read the rest of that passage, it's horrifying. The judgment that comes against those people. So we were on our faces praying for people who had acted like we were nothing to them. We, were, we hadn't been a part of their body. I mean, I know you don't know this, but I had been ministering emotional and physical healing to people in the body for, I'd been doing intern training for a year before we moved up there with the inner healing ministry there in the body. I had been asked to to take over the downtown Dallas location of the healing ministry of that body. So it wasn't like we were people that just showed up on Sunday, Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and, And when I said to the lead pastor, my husband is in trouble and he needs a friend. My husband was grieving. Mm -hmm. My husband had a family full of brothers and cousins who wanted to go to Cabo San Lucas and find Elijah in whatever way they had to find Elijah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my husband needed some Christian men to put their arms around him and help him find a place of sanity. And I said that to the pastor and he took Martin's phone number and he said, I will contact him. And he never called. And, and when I asked, you know, uh, why are these rumors going on? Why have we come back and not one of you have even come to our home? Not one of you have put your arms around us. Not one of you have even acknowledged that this has happened. The, the best answer I got was, well, we don't know you. Well, wow. you know, I didn't know what to say to that. So we prayed for them for two years before God said, okay, you're done now. And pretty quickly after that, we moved back to Nacogdoches to our home and basically just collapsed yeah. physically, emotionally, everything, yeah. trying to find a way to recover from that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I ever told you this, but uh, I think I think it was like 2017, uh, we went to the upper room staff retreat out in West Texas. Um, my, yeah. my ex-wife was their CFO. So, um, the irony, oh, wow. the irony is that while my parents were treated as strangers, you know, I was the CFO's husband and I was running their coffee shop and you know, things were great. And, um, but they don't know you. They, they don't know my parents and the fucked up part I'll say is, and I, I apologize to my mom for this is that I didn't, I didn't fight for my parents at all. I was, um, I was so, uh, so broken up and yeah. so desperate for any sort of structure that I just, I mean, I came home and I speed ran it. I, I proposed to my ex-wife, uh, what was it? Like a month after Elijah went missing. We got married a month and a half after that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I think my mom, my mom and dad were the only people who expressed, you know, concern that, that, that was not the, the right move. Everybody else, the upper room is a very pro marriage church. Yeah. I go for it. Mm-hmm. Go, you know, their CFO finally had a finally had a man, and you know mm-hmm. he was working for him. Like it's great, great thing. So they pushed it, and we we speed ran it, and it was, you know, I have three wonderful children as a result of that. But it was not 
um, a wise decision and we were not shepherded in that decision. And I understand to a certain extent, we're going to do what we're going to do. You know, like my mom will attest to the fact that I'm bullheaded and <laughs> they, they warned me. You don't say. <laughs> they, they warned me and then they, that was it. They, they chose to support me in that. And, um, yeah, but they, I, I just, I also just moved forward. I put my head down and I worked and I, and I moved forward and Sam did the same thing. That was kind of the, the sentence that we held on to was building something for Elijah to come home to. And so we just worked and we built and, um, we, we both shut down in our own special ways. But anyway, 2017, we were at the upper room staff retreat and, and I'll say his name. I've already said Michael Miller's name. So don't be afraid to say that name. I'm, I'm going to name him because he needs to be named. Uh, but Michael Malden stood up in the middle of that meeting and, uh, you know, Elijah came up in that meeting and, uh, Malden was, uh, he's the only person who addressed it really. And he said, you know, I'm the kind of person that when something so horrible happens and, and for reference, I, you know, Malden was, a, an, he was an associate pastor and him and his wife were pretty heavy on the music ministry. But he, he said, when something horrible like that happens, he's like, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. And mm -hmm. so I just don't say anything. He's like, and I know that wasn't the right move. And he's like, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I should have said anything. I, and I didn't know what to say. And, uh, I, I, yeah. What yeah. ownership? Like yeah. in, in a second, I mean, I had no ill will towards him, but in that yeah. moment I was like, man, thank you. Like, yeah. All it took was that. I, yeah. Just say yeah. you don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't ignore us. Don't ignore my, my, my parents. Don't, you know, ignore that reality. Um, yeah. which, which is what they did. And, you know, like my mom said, their only ask was just to reach out to my dad and, uh, Michael, Freeland Miller couldn't be bothered to do that. You know, maybe he had too many rounds of golf to play or, you know, maybe he had too many flights to catch to go preach at other locations around the world. But that's heartbreaking because like, why would I want to follow somebody yeah. um, all of their word if they're not even going to support me? You know, if you're not supporting me, you're not supporting anybody in this church. And so that's heartbreaking to hear that you thought you were going back to support and you didn't get any at all. Not even. A, I'm sorry, man. Like what? That is devastating well, to they hear. they were able to do that because they had all bought the story that he was off doing drugs and girls. And that's unfortunate. You know? I didn't even talk Whether to you guys. Whether they believed it or not. Yeah. Yeah. There was enough. There was enough question in their minds that it was like, oh, okay, so we're not just going to, we're just not going to address that. We're yeah. definitely not going to like partner with their perspective of what has happened. Right. Yeah. With regard to the leadership at the upper room, this is something that we're, what you're going to hear now is my perspective. It's based on 45, 55 years of Bible study and observation and living as part of the church in America. Authority and responsibility are two very important principles that are not given their due in the American church. Any church where the leadership claims to be more spiritual than the laity where they claim, I'm your spiritual leader, you need to listen to me, is out of balance. Because Christ died so that we could be reconciled to God. Christ was resurrected, and then he left us here alone mm -hmm. so the Holy Spirit could come and be with us for the express purpose of fulfilling dozens of years of Old Testament sacrificial lambs in the temple, in the tabernacle out in the open under the stars where God called a guy to do it first. He fulfilled all that so that the Holy Spirit could now come and live inside each one of us. That was never intended to be a silent partnership. Mm -hmm. If we cannot hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, then we're in trouble. And if we then turn to another human being who says, Hey, I have spiritual authority over you. And we listen to them. Now we're in double trouble. Mm -hmm. And that's what was going on in that church. I'm, I hear God more clearly than you do, so let me tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. That's not what Christ ever intended. He paid what he paid so that each of us can be strong, can walk in our spiritual authority, can hear the voice of God. God was talking to humans from the very beginning, mm -hmm. and he never stopped. Yeah. It was other humans who said, oh, who do you think you are that you can say God would talk to you? That was never God's perspective. Yeah. Christ, as a matter of fact, said, my sheep know my voice, 
and they obey me, which is really chilling. If you don't know his voice, then you got some work to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and that's why we laid on our faces for two years praying for that group of people. Yep. Yeah, and it's still, still that way, um, unfortunately. So um, I don't want to tie you up for too long because uh, you know I know you got work to do. <laughs> but uh, any any other closing thoughts, closing words? Yes. This was a really horrible thing to live through. And I'm not going to lie and say that it doesn't affect me every day because it does. But the truth is that God is good. Mm. And God was involved in this. And when God said to me, okay, at the same time that this happened, my best friend, my sister, my heart sister, was having a medical procedure. She had a stroke at the end of the medical procedure. And she was alive, but she did not know where she was in time. She didn't know who half the people in her life was. And pretty quickly the day came, she didn't really know who I was. So I was taking care of her because I had all of her financial and medical power of authorities. I was her responsible person. I was taking care of her the same weekend that Elijah disappeared. So in the same weekend, I lost my son and my closest friend. Mm -hmm. It was really, really hard, and it changed my life. But God said to me, as I was driving back from where I had left her in care, to Dallas to figure out what the heck was going on with Elijah. I got lost, which never happens. And I pulled over in Bluebell, where the cows are happy. (laughs) And uh, it was was deserted. I was in a convenience store that was closed in the middle of a Saturday. And so I was sitting in this parking lot. I'm like, okay, I'm lost. I can perceive that you have something you want to say to me, God, so let's hear it. And he said, Teresa, it doesn't matter what has already happened to Elijah. What happens next is what is important, what I do next. And so with that information and warning on my heart, I went back to Dallas, and we tried to pay very close attention to what God was doing in this situation. God was doing what he had to do to accomplish something. The fact that I don't know the end of that story does not mean that God was not active. He is good. Mm -hmm. He wants the best for us. He does the best he can with the choices that we give him, that we leave him. So I don't know what's going on here. I don't know where my child is. I know that we lost an entire life. We don't have his children. We don't have his wife. We don't have those memories that we should have had. And I know that very few people that should have cared for us, cared that that happened. Mm. But none of that is a reflection on the character of God. Yeah. None of it. And that's really my, that's my takeaway from this. People are shit, <laughs> but Amen. God is always good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. And that. it's my job to figure out, in whatever situation I find myself in, how is this possibly good? I have to look for it sometimes. And sometimes I don't see it until, you know, years later. But that's my job. How is this good? Yeah. Yeah. And I partner with the good. Yeah. Because if you think I couldn't partner with the evil, you would be very wrong. Hmm. What happened in Mexico could have been a very different story. I'm not a stupid girl, and I'm not without resources. Hmm. And in, in the situation with Elijah, we were not without resources. God provided resources for us virtually free. I mean, we paid them, but we didn't pay them much. Who were almost more concerned with finding Elijah than we were. And they had the experience and the tools to make it happen. So I found myself in the position of having to tell men of power, no, they couldn't do things in my name. And that if I found out they did things to get information outside of my name, uh, it would not go well for them. That's not someplace you ever want to be, you know. Mm-hmm. But God is good. And, and the whole time we were dealing with this, 
I had to keep saying to them, I, I know that you've had a different experience than us. These men were not Christians. I know that your life has been different, and I know there are ways you can handle this, but we're not going to do it that way. And if you do it that way, you're not going to be doing it in my name. Because God is good, and he would not do it that way. So we left room for God to do his will. And sometimes that's all we have to do. We just have to make room for God to do what he wants to do. But that's hard, because everybody around us is telling us what we ought to be doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Mom, I appreciate you coming on and sharing. Um, I know that you were hesitant to do so, and I know that this story is not one to just be flaunted around all laissez-faire and, and your testimony and, and your perspective is is priceless. And so I just, I thank you for being vulnerable and, and sharing that with us. Yeah, thank yes, you thank sharing. you so much. You're welcome. Well, uh, I love you, Mom. You have a good day at work, okay? <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to give that a real shot. (laughs) (laughs) Drink plenty of espresso. It was really nice to be with you guys this morning. Y'all have a good day. Thank Thank you. you. Bye-bye. I loved hearing her voice, and you can just hear in her voice, you know? She really is strong in her faith. Oh, yes. Yeah. I don't know that I would be. No, like that to was hear the strength hear. that she has, like yes. I probably would have lit buildings on fire. So likewise, yeah. I was young, right? When she's right. telling people, you know, like don't go out and do the things you want to do. Yeah, you know, I'm sure you've had family members that is very strong to do. Yeah, because you think as a mom, you're like, no, ain't nothing going to stop me. Desperation, yeah. Ugh. I think at the time, I I viewed their restraint as weakness in my youth, and uh, if I'd had my way, we would have burned everything down, right. and I would have, you know, met up with my dad's siblings and my cousins, and we would have just I still think about it, you know, oh, yeah. even if there's nothing left down there, I still, yeah. you know, when she An said answer. that, yeah. yeah, when she said that she told you guys to not come when you had said it the last episode, I thought like, well, why not? Mm-hmm. But hearing her say yeah. that, I get it. And I knew, I knew her perspective. Was I invaluable. get it that I'm sure there was yeah. a realization too, that she kind of felt like she'd already lost one son. Yeah, yes. she, she says she would have lost all of her sons you and her went husband in. as well. You yeah, were angry. We gone hard. Absolutely. Yeah. And, it, you know, I was 20. Regardless of whether I had any skills or any talents, I was angry. And yes. I was 20. And you I, looking. you know, that's dangerous. Yes. Um, so that is that is my mom's perspective on what everything. A strong woman. Um, what will follow in the next episode is the aftermath. Um, she touched on the interactions with the church, but there was, you know, mm-hmm. some more stuff and um, just closing thoughts on the whole, yeah. the whole situation. Um, where the hell Elijah Hernandez is. We all have questions that maybe like we skimmed over or Ben was short on. Ask us below. Yeah. We'd yeah. love to go more into detail on things. I'll, I'll answer any questions. And respect in the comments. all of these people. You heard his mom. Please. Yeah. Keep her name clean. She is a kind and that was so great to hear her. So yeah. Thank you, Ben, for inviting yeah. her on. Yeah. That was really yeah. nice. Thank you, Mom. Appreciate <laughs> you. Thank you guys. Um I think that's enough for today. Yeah. yeah. I think I think part I think three has to happen good, that yeah, way. I think part three. Yeah. Absolutely. I want to make sure it's covered fully and in all seriousness that um, we cover it right. So that was really great to hear from her. And so next episode, episode yeah. no, part three, part, part three. three, the wrap up of it all. The we'll up. see y'all then. All right. Yes. Oh, that was kind of heavy, but you guys know, keep the giggles going and the love flowing. And until next time, mom, mom knows best. best. Or at least she's trying her best. <laughs> yes, yes, she is. Good job, Ben. <laughs> Bye guys. Bye.